Love one another. Man, pretty basic Bible phrase here and something that we know that we as Christians are supposed to do. And the, the series that we're going through is address the mess. So what is the mess that we need to talk about here this morning that we need to identify before we jump into the message? Well, now that we are convinced that we're better together, we're all going to serve one another. We're going to use our gifts. How many of you agree that it could get a little bit messy and a little bit complicated doing life together? Anybody think that that could be the case? Okay, some of you are nodding your heads. Yes, that is the case. It's almost as if God knows that that's going to be an objection that we bring up. Because he does know. He knows everything. And so what's interesting here about where he goes now in Romans chapter 12 is he's he's not running away from the challenge that it's going to be. He's not sugarcoating it. He's not softening up. He's not just saying, hey, sometimes people might get on your nerves. And if you just hug it out a little bit, it's going to be okay. That's not what he's saying here. He's actually saying, it's going to be a challenge. And I want you to embrace the challenge. Those verses that we read this morning, verses 9 through 16, There were 13 different commands. You just got done reading 13 different commands that God gave us that we need to know so that way we can truly learn how to love one another the way that God wants us to do because that's our reasonable service. Our reasonable service is to love one another. So before we jump into our message this morning, okay, I want you to look at that person. If they're here from last week, you might not even remember who it was. Look at somebody that's not in your family and I want you to look at them and say, you know what? I love you. Tell people you love them today. Good. Okay, that's good. I like that. And by the way, if it's too awkward just to go in with I love you, like you can be like a guy and just be like, love you, man. That's just, that just softens it up a little bit, you know? The point is, though, if we're going to be better together, we got to get used to the fact that we are the church, we are the body of Christ, and we do need to love one another. You can't pick and choose. We are one body. We are members of the same family. We're going to spend all of eternity together. Praise God. We better start liking each other. We better start loving each other. And so we're going to learn about, we're going to take our time with this, by the way, too. You know what, today, I'm only doing one verse today, only verse nine. Now, I'll probably pick it up a little bit, but there's 13 commands that are given here. You can't just brush through these things. They're they're all loaded. There's a lot of different things here that we just need to digest and take time to make sure that we fully understand so that way we can be everything that God wants us to be. So let's just dive right in. The first thing that I want us to see this morning is actually the title of my message is the first point, love one another. There's some introductory things that I want to just say and, and help us to fully be able to embrace where we're going. The first thing is this, love is a more excellent way. Love is a more excellent way. Verse nine begins with, Let love be. Let love be. This whole section, everything that follows, it's all tied into the fact that we're not supposed to just love God with all of our hearts, but we're supposed to love our neighbor. We're supposed to love one another in the body of Christ as ourselves. I believe what's happening here in Romans 12 is a condensed version of what happens in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing to a very divided church of Corinth. And man, they had issues. They divided over everything. They were like, some were, they were in different groups. They're like, I think Paul's our leader. I think Peter's our leader. I think Apollos is our leader. All three of them were men of God, but yet they're dividing up in these factions and they've got sin and they're all competing for the best gifts. And so Paul gets to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and he just unleashes a couple chapters about how beautiful the body of Christ is. And how important it is that we dwell together in unity, just like we talked about last week. And how God's given all of us spiritual gifts and how we're supposed to use them in service for one another, just like we talked about last week. And then he gets to the end of verse 12 and he says, covet earnestly the best gifts. You know what I said to our church today? Desire to be used by God. Do you want God to use you? Do you want God to use you? (laughs) There we go. Yes. Covet earnestly the best gifts. Man, if, if it's true that as a child of God, God's given you a gift, well, desire it. Ask God to show it to you. Ask him to use you in great ways to make a difference in the hearts and lives of other people for his honor and for his glory. Covet earnestly the best gifts. And then he gets to the end of verse 12 and he says, yet show I unto you a more excellent way. 
And then he goes into 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is probably one of the most beautiful chapters on love in the entire Bible. And he starts off with, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am nothing. Though I give my body to be burned, though I sell all my goods and give to the poor and have not charity, I am nothing. It doesn't matter how talented we are. It doesn't matter how many gifted servants of Jesus Christ we have. If we don't have love one for another, we are nothing. And nothing that we do and nothing that we say ultimately will be able to bring honor and glory to God. Love is a more excellent way. And that's where we're going here in Romans chapter 12. These 13 commands that we're talking about, that's the more excellent way. You want to just have a good life? Or do you want to have the best life? And I think sometimes we sell out and we settle. And you know what? If you want the best life, if you want the more excellent way, it's going to involve work. It's going to involve sacrifice. But it's going to be absolutely worth it in every single way. So love is a more excellent way. Secondly, love is learned by God. Love is learned by God. Look at verse 9. Just the very beginning phrase. I'll just read it one more time. It says, let love be without dissimulation. That word for love there is agape. There's several different words for love that's used throughout the New Testament, but this word is agape. Did you know that agape was a rare word? It was a very rare word in non-biblical Greek literature, but it becomes very common in the New Testament. In fact, Paul himself uses the word agape 75 times. Now, that's a really big deal. It's, it's very rare in non-biblical literature, but it becomes very common inside of God's word. And I believe that that's not by accident or by coincidence because the word agape expresses the distinctive nature of God's love. It's a love that you don't naturally see in this world. It's a love that expresses God's divine nature and is supposed to become a part of our spiritual nature, the new man that we are in Christ. And you know what agape love is? It is characterized by sacrifice in the pursuit of another person's good. Agape love is characterized by sacrifice in pursuit of another person's good. Paul's already used this word several times in the book of Romans. Like, for instance, in Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love, his sacrificial love toward us, in that while we were yet, Christ died for us. Before we had anything good to offer him. Man, we were rebellious. We are sinners. We are guilty. There's nothing that we could do to save ourselves. Even our righteousness is as filthy rags. And yet, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. That's what we're talking about. That's, that's agape love. That's where we're headed. Man, it's the kind of love where in Romans chapter 8, he gets, it gets to the end of that and he says, Who shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord? Shall tribulations, shall persecution, shall famine, shall sword, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors, for I am persuaded that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's agape love. Agape love. Christ died for us, and he refuses to ever let us go. He's got your best interest in mind. He's got your best interest in heart. Love is learned from God. You know how God wants us to live in love and in relationship with one another? The same exact way. It's not about me. I'm supposed to be dead completely to myself. It's about others. It's about living with that, a love that's characterized by sacrifice in pursuit of another person's good. You want to honor what Christ did for you on the cross, love one another the same way that he loved you. Now, we need his help and his strength, obviously, for that, but love is learned from God. That's what he's asking. That's what he's expecting. And last but not least, just by way of introduction, just under this first point, love one another, love works. Love works in an absolutely phenomenal and beautiful way. I came across this um, statement while I was studying, and this, this person said this, love is the circulatory system of the spiritual body, which enables all members to function in a healthy, harmonious 
way. So I was like, love is the circulatory system of the, man, that sounds like a good illustration there. So I started Googling, looking up circulatory system. I'm going back to science class. It's been a long time since I've done any science class. And I started looking up the circulatory system. Go ahead and put that picture up here. Here's a little picture of the circulatory system. Did you know that your body, this is phenomenal. Your body is made up of 60,000 miles of veins that flow throughout your body. That's enough if they were to stretch them all out in a line that could go around the world two times and have a little bit left over. Inside of this body right here is 60,000. I mean, that's absolutely insane for me to even try to wrap my mind around. Our body's intricate. But by the way, we just, it all just happened by chance, right? It just, we bumped into each other and bam, here we are. No, we have an intelligent creator and a designer. So 60,000 miles. What's at the center of the, circular, the circulatory system? The, the heart. Yeah, the heart. If you notice in that picture up there, you'll see red and blue. The red is flowing from the heart, and it's oxygenated blood that is flowing through your body. And the blue is deoxygenated, deoxygenated blood that is flowing back to the heart, and it just all moves and pumps and flows in rhythm. And I learned some phenomenal things about the circulatory system. And I'm looking at a nurse right here on the front row, and I'm praying to God I get this right, okay? <laughs> But as the blood flows to and from the heart, it circulates oxygen, which is good, and carbon dioxide, which is not good, yeah, bad, good and bad. You all are with me today. This is good, all right? It provides our cells with nutrients that we need. It removes harmful waste products. I'm not going to go into detail on any of this stuff. I'm just kind of giving you the overview. It protects the body against disease and infection. And it creates clotting, which stops the bleeding. I mean, the circulatory system has a pretty phenomenal aspect of what happens and what takes place in the body. Does anybody see the glory of where this could be going this morning? Think about this. When you got saved, you became a new person in Jesus Christ, right? And often we tell people, especially when kids get saved, they'll go around and they say, I got saved. Jesus lives in my heart. And that's what we'll say. And in fact, he does. We've already learned from Romans. The spirit of Christ lives inside of you. Now, if you want to go back to Romans, you don't have to go there, but Romans 12, verse 1, this chapter began with, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. I know this is just an illustration. This isn't necessarily exactly what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say the, um, the, you know, the mercies of God are like the circulatory. So this is just an illustration to help it to come to life, okay? But the way that I see this is the mercies of God. God's love literally gave us 60,000 miles of his mercies that are flowing in us, that are alive inside of us. I mean, I, the way that I look at it is the mercies of God, they flow from the very heart of who Jesus Christ is and they breathe that spiritual oxygen through our lives so that we can be the people that he wants us to be. And as we go through life, guess what? We run into people and maybe we experience some hurt and maybe we, uh, people do things and say things that aren't always right and always good and that, that deoxygenated blood flows back into the heart of Jesus Christ. And it's all about the mercies of God. The mercies of God enable us to have the health and the vitality and the life that we need and the mercies of God enable us to forgive and to get over bitterness and to be able to love one another even though people are going to hurt you and people are going to let you down the mercies of God provide healing the mercies of God are incredible love works listen that, that inside of this body of believers when we're loving one another when we're overwhelmed ourselves by the mercies of God and who he is. Wow. Think about how that just engages and enables us to do what honestly is humanly impossible. Love one another. Now let's just start getting right down into all the practical applications of where we're going. So the second thing that we're going to talk about, if we're going to love one another, you know what we need to be? We need to be genuine. We need to be genuine. All right, look back at verse 9, first phrase. The Bible says this. Let love be, everybody read those two words out loud together, without dissimulation. Does anybody know what that means? It literally means without hypocrisy. Let love be without hypocrisy. Or you could say it positively. Let love be genuine. Hypocrite's a pretty cool word because guess what? It comes from a Greek word which is hypocrite. And hypocrite was the Greek word back at that time which meant an actor or a stage player. So a hypocrite was what they called actors. 
and people that would get on the stage. What makes this word even more interesting is back in that time period too, a lot of times actors would wear masks on stage they would, that would reveal who their character was, but it would honestly hide who they truly were, who their real identity was. So you understand what a hypocrite is. Hypocrite is someone that's an actor, a stage player, somebody who's hiding who they really truly are inside. And the command here is that the church must not turn itself into a stage where it's only acting out love. Love must be genuine. Love must be without hypocrisy. We don't just come in and and, and just very casually say, hey, I love you. We don't just have words up that say love God and love others. It needs to be the very fiber of who we are because it's the very fiber of who God is. We can't just act and pretend like we love others. We genuinely need to love one another. Do you know that hypocrisy is more natural than love? <laughs> because we're sinners, Right? The Bible tells us that our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. I think hypocrisy is way more natural than love. I, I, I came up with a few questions that I want to ask us all today. And they're not aimed at anyone in particular. These are questions I need to ask myself. I think these are questions that we need to review all the time on a regular basis because our hearts are prone to wonder. Our hearts are prone to get cold very easily. And I think we need to ask ourselves the honest truth and ask ourselves honest questions from time to time to make sure that we are being genuine, that our love is without dissimulation. And remember, too, this isn't just for others outside the church. This is for one another. This is for each other in the church. So here's some questions just to get you thinking today. Do I struggle to give grace to others? Do I struggle to give grace to others? Hypocrites are more than willing to accept the grace of God we all like his mercy and we all like his grace, but we have a hard time extending it to other people. You might be a hypocrite if you assume the worst in others, but believe the best about yourself. If you're willing to give yourself a free pass, then be willing to give others a free pass. See others the way that God sees you. So do I struggle to give grace to others? Here's another question. Do I wish people acted just like me? And the answer to that question is yes. Man, if everyone acted like me, this world would be amazing. No, just kidding. That's what we think, though, sometimes, isn't it? Oh, this world would be a mess if everyone thought, just acted just like me. Hypocrites are critical of people who live, worship, vote, look, serve, give, breathe differently. You ever just think that sometimes? Is there anybody that can ever get it right and do it right? That's a wrong attitude. You might be a hypocrite if you can't appreciate people who see things differently than you do. You know what I think is very dangerous today? It's a wonderful tool. It's also a very dangerous tool, but social media. And you know what, what hurts my heart, what, what smites my heart every time I think about it is how quickly Christians are to pounce on one another. I'm reminded of a verse in James that says, Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Our world is the exact opposite. They don't care. The world could care less what anybody else thinks or what their opinion or how you came to that conclusion. The world is swift to speak. The world is swift to anger. You see that on social media. You turn on the news. You see that over and over again. We are here to be different, right? So our job is we should be swift to hear. Before we come to conclusions, we ought to go talk to somebody. We ought to figure out why they made that decision or why they think that way. You'll be surprised at all the amazing things that you can learn from other people and the different perspectives that we can come to in life. Do I wish people acted just like me? Here's another question. Do others know your true self? I think this one's a tough one that all of us struggle with. Do others know your true self? Hypocrites work so hard on building up the perfect image that no one can know who they really are. Man, the perfect Christian image. On the outside, everything is in its right place. Everything looks really good. But if we're not careful, we don't let anybody else in. And you might be a hypocrite if you never let your guard down and you never let others in. Can I tell you, there's people that have been in church for 30, 40, 50 years. They come faithfully. They give. They maybe even serve. But if you're not willing to open yourself up and to be vulnerable to other people and let other people in, you're not going to be fully effective. You're not going to be fully used by God. 
We've got to be willing to humble ourselves. Now, there's such a thing as oversharing. How many of you met that person? It's like the first time you're talking to them. It's like, holy cow, I didn't need to know all of that. Like, push some of that back a little bit, you know? We need to be careful with that. I'm not necessarily saying that. I think there's wisdom involved. But as you truly get to know one another, as you get into a connect group, as you start serving with other people, as you start um, being hospitable and you invite people over to your house and the common bond that you have is Christ, there ought to be times where you open up and you let other people in and they know how to pray for you and they know what you struggle with and you can keep yourself accountable. If we're going to grow, we've got to be genuine, let love be without dissimulation. We're no better than anybody else. We shouldn't be looking down on anybody else. We should be willing to open up to people that God's placed in our lives so that we can grow in grace. Here's the last question. Am I more concerned with rules or relationships? <laughs> Hypocrites are people who care more about their property, possessions, and rules of worship than they do about people's lives being changed. They're like the religious leaders who got so mad at Jesus. I think of this. <laughs> the religious leaders got so mad at Jesus because he healed somebody on the Sabbath day. And they accused Jesus. They said, there's six days of work and one to rest. How dare you heal somebody on the Sabbath day? And Jesus looks at them and says, y'all have animals? You take them out to feed them? You lead them to water? That's considered work. And you know what essentially he's saying? You care more about your animals. You care more about your donkey. You care more about your cattle. You care more about your sheep than you do about people. You work for that. And here's this person who's had their life transformed and their life completely changed. And you could care less. Something's wrong with that. Something's off, and if we're honest, sometimes we can fall into those same traps. We care more about our lives and our comforts and our preferences and our rules of worship than we do about souls being changed and lives being changed for God's honor and for God's glory. Hey, we might be hypocrites if we spend more time talking about what we don't like or what's wrong with the church than we do telling others about Jesus and getting them to him. And can I tell you, the need of the hour is great. I don't think there's anybody in America, it doesn't matter if they're saved or unsaved, that thinks we're headed in a better direction. <laughs> think there's something that we can all agree on. I believe Jesus could return at any moment. I believe we need to be longing and looking forward to that day. We don't know when we're gonna breathe our last breath. We don't have time to waste on silly, frivolous things. We need to get people to Jesus and we need to do everything we can to reach people with the gospel of Jesus. Let love be without dissimulation, be genuine. Oh, before I jump into that, listen. You know what I find amazing about Jesus? I was thinking about this this week. Jesus wasn't filled with a holy, righteous, vehement anger when the woman who was caught in the very act of idolatry was brought to him. You know what he said? Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Jesus wasn't filled with that holy, righteous, vehement anger when he sat down and ate with the publicans and sinners. Jesus wasn't filled with that holy, righteous, vehement anger when he was telling the parable about the prodigal son who wandered away, squandered his inheritance, but he came back to his father. And what did his father do? Ran out and met him with open arms. Jesus wasn't filled with vehement anger and rage when the people that hung him on the cross put him there, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know when he was filled with vehement rage and anger? It was to religious leaders. It was to people who claimed the name of God and were claiming to lead people to God. But in all actuality, they were leading people away from God. Let love be without dissimulation. Be genuine. Love should be the most pure Real, genuine thing in all the world. You know how genuine love begins? With humility. There's a lot of different ways I could go with this. There's a lot of different things that I could say. But I was thinking of one more illustration where Jesus was teaching. And he said, you see that Pharisee over there? He's standing up and he's praying, God, thank you that I'm not like these publicans and sinners. I'm better than them. He said, look over there at that tax collector who wouldn't even lift his eyes toward heaven, but he was just beating his chest, saying, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. 
If we want to love genuinely, if we want to love without hypocrisy, it starts on our knees. It starts before the holiness of God. It starts with us beating our chest saying, God, I'm nothing but a sinner that's saved by grace. And I need your mercy. I need it to flow through me so that it can flow out of me. Because this world needs your love. And this world needs your grace. And this world needs your mercy. Oh, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. If we all start it like that, I promise you, the unity would continue to grow. And by the way, I just want to say this before I jump into the next point. I can preach this message with peace and confidence because I can't think of our, our church. I'm not thinking of major problems. We have a wonderful spirit of unity. I'm trying to lay this out so that way we can continue to grow in that and we can hunger and thirst for that even more. And I'm, I'm thankful for our church. You all like to hear truth preached. You all respond well to it. And I'm not saying that, that we don't all have issues with this from time to time. I absolutely am. We need to pay attention to it. But I do want to say thank you for receiving the truth and for having that spirit of unity. Let's go deeper. Let's go further. Let's let God continue to make this real in our lives. And last but not least, and we're done this morning. If we're going to love one another, we don't just need to be genuine. We need to hate evil and embrace good. Hate evil embrace good. Look at the end of verse 9. It says, let love be without dissimulation. Everybody help me out here on this last part. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Hate evil, embrace good. You know what this verse implies? This verse implies that there is such a thing as good and evil in this world because there is good and evil in this world. Good and evil are not subjective. Good is not simply what you want to be good, and evil is not simply what you determine to be evil. Good and evil are objective realities outside of us. There is an objective. There is absolutes. There is absolutely good. There is absolutely evil. They are objective realities outside of ourselves because guess why? God is an objective reality outside of ourselves. Whether you want to believe in God or don't believe in God, it does not change the fact that he is God and that one day we're going to stand before him. Good is what God says good is. Evil is what God says evil is. I love the flow here. Because you know what he's saying? Love is not frivolous. I just got done talking about let your love be without dissimulation. Be genuine. Don't be hypocritical. But it's not frivolous. Genuine love does not mean unconditional acceptance. Love is not genuine if it leads someone to do something evil or to avoid doing something what is right, okay? That's not genuine love. It's not just giving a blanket, conditional, unconditional acceptance saying, I love you exactly the way you are. Yes, we do, and God loves people exactly the way they are, but he wants to change us. He wants to make us more like him, and there's good in this world, and there's evil in this world, and he's telling us right here, abhor, hate evil, Embrace, cleave, embrace good. Hate evil. Hypocrisy is evil. Sexual immorality and impurity is evil. Hatred, strife, jealousy is evil. Anger is evil. Drunkenness is evil. Rivalries, dissension, Division is evil. A critical spirit is evil. Gossip is evil. Complaining is evil. Loving this world is evil. Illegal substances are evil. The Bible has a lot to say about what is wrong, what is evil, what is not good for you, what is not healthy. And simply agreeing that evil is evil is not enough. Can't just be sitting here this morning like, yeah, I get it. I know all those things are bad. Evil's evil. God says it's evil. I get it. That's not what he's telling us to do here. Intensity is required. Abhor, hate, despise, loathe, evil. You understand what he's saying? This is not soft. Intensity is required. Be disgusted. Abhor evil. Abhor anything that could hurt you or your family. Abhor anything that could get in and wreck and ruin the unity of the body of Christ inside of here. Hate the lies of Satan that are breaking homes and destroying families. Abhor that which is evil. We're not playing games. 
We have an enemy that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And we need to be on guard. And if we're going to love God with all of our heart, and if we're going to love others the way that we love ourselves, we've got to hate evil. Hate it enough to run from it. Hate it enough to mortify it, to kill it. Hate evil enough to confess it and get help. Let your love be without dissimulation. Be genuine. Go to somebody and say, I'm struggling with this. It's evil. It's going to ruin me. I need help. I need accountability. Confess it. Hate evil enough to speak up and say something to a friend, to a family member that's headed in a bad direction, even if they're going to get mad at you, even if they're going to get upset. If it's evil, if it's going to hurt and ruin their lives, say something. Hey, hate evil enough to get with your friend's parents and to say, by God's grace, we're going to pray for our kids together. There's nobody I think that's at more danger than our children that are coming up. They've got all kinds of technology and tools and temptations and things that are just readily available. And I'm not going to, the Bible says to be careful about saying the former days are better than these. Okay, there's nothing new under the sun. I do believe, though, that there is a lot of things that are so readily available to our children. And you know what? We as parents need to do, we need to get on the same page, especially those of us that go to church together. And we need to weep with those who weep and we need to pray and we need to be burdened. Are we going to just talk about church and the ideal of church or are we going to be the church? Man, I'm thankful for some of the parents of the friends that my kids have in their lives that have this same heart, that have this same desire because we desperately need God and we've got to abhor the evil enough to get on our knees and to pray passionately for each other that God would help us. Hate evil. Embrace good. I want to put this out because this could come across if we're not careful, if there's not the balance here we can start coming across as really angry, bitter people that don't like everything. (laughs) And by the way, sometimes Christians have that persona. God help us. It's easy sometimes to get on, again, to be hypocritical even and get on our, beat our drums about the things that we know are evil and that we think are important. But at the same time, there's a reverse to this and it's to embrace good. And as much as we loathe and despise and as much intensity we have towards the things that can destroy us and our families and our homes... Oh, man, there needs to be a joy and a cleaving unto that which is good. Humility is good. Mercy is good. Forgiveness is good. Giving God praise and thanks is good. Sex inside of marriage is good. God's will for your life is good. Serving God is good. His word is good. His promises are good. His character is good. Everything about God is good. Being filled with the spirit is better than being filled with any intoxicating, abusive substances. It's better than drugs. It's better than alcohol. It's better than any of those things that you can give you because you have a clear mind and you have a clear conscience and you can give God God honor and glory instead of doing things that bring shame and embarrassment into our lives. Can I tell you, being thankful is good. Being filled with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs is good. Saturate your mind with Jesus and who he is and the promises of his word. Embrace good. You must cleave, the Bible tells us. It's hold fast. Glue yourself. That's the idea, like glue yourself. Stick yourself to good. Attach yourself to it. Love good. I'm going to ask my wife to come up here. She's going to help me with this closing illustration because I think it will help, hopefully, bring this home. But when Alana and I started dating around 21 years ago, 20 and a half years ago, we had this one very fun conversation where we were like defining the relationship. She's like, what's going on here between the two of us? Only by God's grace am I married to this wonderful, beautiful woman. (laughs) We had been friends for a long time. Yeah, that's true. She knows it every day. She's like, how did this happen? Only God's grace. (laughs) At that conversation, I I think I even mentioned at one point, well, I'm coming around. That's a horrible thing to say. (laughs) And then I said this too. I kid you not, this is not a lie. I said, well, if I want to play basketball, I want to play basketball. And she's like, play basketball. And I was like, okay, that's good. I mean, this is the stuff that we talked about. I mean, 
absolutely ridiculous. You know what the funny thing was in all of this? Like from that night forward, we walked out of there. I don't think I've ever really played basketball again in my life. I, I didn't realize how hard and how fast I had fallen. And outside of God and outside of salvation, this is she, not this, she <laughs> is the very best thing that has ever happened to me in my life. And from that day forward, you know what I did? I embraced that was good. What was good, man? It was like this. And I just realized that wherever she is, I want to be. And she's like, dear God, play basketball, man. (laughs) And literally, we don't go around like that, obviously, everywhere we go. But figuratively, in my mind, I cleave to that which is good. I want to be where my wife is. There's nobody I want to spend time with more than I want to spend time with her. And yes, we do things with other people, but she's the person that I want to be with. She's the one that I want to do life with. Even after 20 years, I'm still embracing what is good. I'm glued to her. I'm stuck for better or for worse till death do us part. Mm, Yes. (laughs) Give her a big round of applause. Head back to your seat. I threw that kiss in there just to gross my kids out because in the 40s, I want to embrace all of that stuff. But do you understand the seriousness of where we want to go, where, where this is going? Embrace that which is good. Do you believe that God is good? Do you believe that his will is the absolutely best thing that you could ever have and find in your life? Embrace it. Yes, we have to abhor and hate evil, but just put as much energy into embracing the good. There's a positive side. It's not like God wanted to come down here and wreck and ruin all the fun that you could have in this life. No, he's got something a hundred million times better than anything your sin could ever give you, than anything this world could ever give you. Hey, I don't know what it is in your life. Maybe it's a promise of God that you just need to cling to and get a hold of and say, God, if you say it, then I'm gonna believe it. Maybe there's a sin that you just need to let go of and it's had a grip on your life and you just can't imagine your life without it. Can I tell you, if God says that he's got something greater and better for you, then embrace it, cling to it, stick to it. God wants to pour out his blessings on your life in incredible ways. And you might be sitting here thinking, I thought this message was about loving one another. It is, because if we all, abhor and hate that which is evil, and we all are cleaving to that which is good. Yeah, we're going to be genuine. We're not going to be perfect. Oh, we're going to mess up and we're going to fail. But we're all going to be on the same page. And we're all going to be fighting the same battles. And we're all going to be pursuing the same things. And there's a world outside that needs to see us embracing what's good. And then they look at our lives and they say, what? How are you so filled with love and joy and peace and self-control and gen? What's different about you? Nothing, it's nothing about me. It's Jesus in me. It's his truth. It's his word. It's his will. It's his plans. It's everything that he has for me. That's what's different. Embrace what is good. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Let's all stand to our feet. They're already playing. Will you come to an altar this morning? I feel like, I'm not, I don't want to be the Holy Spirit in your life, but honestly, I feel I've felt this in my own life this week. A message like this, truth like this, it deserves a response. We cannot continue just to go on in our apathy. We can't be complacent. We've got to be passionate.